Hi, it's me, Franklin, and here I am, under a tree. This week we're going to be spending a little bit of time talking about threads. This last week we were looking at processes and how they differed from programs, and we learned a lot about how an operating system represents a process, so the information that it needs to keep track of to represent a running process, and basically the mechanism by which an operating system makes it seem like many processes are running at the same time on a system. By being able to regain control of the processor after a process has started running on it, and then context switching, switching back and forth between processes. Looking at threads now, we're going to be looking at something that is related to processes. We're actually going to be seeing some common things between processes and threads, and we're going to be seeing some pretty big differences between processes and threads. We're also going to look at some issues that come up with executing threads concurrently, so at the same time, uh, on a processor at any given time. So we've jumped now from chapters 4, 5, and 6 to chapters 26 and 27. And that, that seems like a pretty big jump, but these chapters are fairly standalone. So chapters 26 and 27, there's a lot in between there, but we don't have to worry too much about that stuff that happens in between. There are a couple of references to other stuff that's in between, but I'll try to make sure that I cover enough of that so that we're on the same page. So we don't have to worry too much about what has happened in those other chapters, but we can focus on what's happening now in these chapters. So, the content in these two chapters, 26 and 27, is talking about threads, but very specifically on Unix systems, on Linux systems, we're looking at a library, an interface that's called pthreads. Threads and pthreads are basically a thread of execution. So, a thread of execution is going to be uh, some part of a program that is currently executing. Multiple threads of execution can be happening within a single process. Up until this point, we've had processes, and we haven't thought of this word thread, but every process that we launch has one thread of execution. So there's something that's running within the context of that process that's actually doing the execution that that process has. I don't really like the way that chapter 26 describes threads in that it doesn't actually visualize what a thread is. And so I've drawn a diagram that I want to kind of step you through. Basically, we've got process, we've got a process that represents a running program. So I've called this process A. Process A, when it's running, has a single thread of execution. So what that means is that process A has exactly one program counter, exactly one PC. And what that means is that only one line of code in that program is going to be executing at any point in time. Really, realistically speaking, that means that only one instruction of that program is executing at any given time. So we're going down at a, a little bit of a lower level than statements in a high-level programming language, but instead we're now looking at instructions. So process A here has exactly one thread of execution. It has one program counter, and it also has exactly one stack. That one thread of execution has access to the entirety of memory. We're going to call this virtual memory now. When we imagine this, when we imagine what memory looks like, it's this giant array that starts at zero and goes all the way up until, I don't know, however many gigabytes of RAM that you have installed on your system. In terms of what a process sees, we're going to call this virtual memory. That process, as far as it's concerned, is entirely alone in the context of that. It has access to all of that memory all by itself. So we've got a process that's running, that process has one thread of execution, that one thread of execution has one program counter and one stack, and that one thread of execution has access to all of memory. 
There may be other processes, so there might be process B and C, and they may also have one exactly one thread of execution, but they see an entirely different perception of memory. They can't see what process A sees. In terms of a multi-threaded process, the way that this is going to work is that we're going to have a process. That process is going to have memory that it has access to, except now we're going to have multiple threads of execution. What this basically means is that we're going to have multiple program counters for one single process. That means that we might have thread one, which has a program counter of five. So we're going to be saying that it's executing line five in this example, but it's executing some instruction that's starting at around line five. And then we might have thread two below that. So its program counter might be 23 and maybe program counter at 23 is often some function in the do stuff function. Both of these threads of execution are concurrently executing within the context of this process. They're both executing at the same time. They're both executing within the context of this process and that means that they both have access to exactly the same memory. So they can both access the same memory that's within process A. These threads again run within the context of a single process. So we've got one process, one process may have many threads of execution. All of the threads of execution that are within a single process share access to the same memory, the same contents of memory, the same addresses and so on. Just like we talked about processes being able to do context switches. So let's take a step back here. We've got this idea of cooperative and non-cooperative multitasking, where in cooperative multitasking, processes can give up control of the processor by doing something like a system call, which then goes into the operating system. So there's a mode switch, then the operating system at that point can choose to switch to a different process. Alternatively, we have non-cooperative multitasking where we have that extra hardware support, that timer interrupts. The timer fires, it brings control back to the operating system from the process and the operating system can then choose to switch to another process. So at that point, it's context switching. It's taking the registers, the value of the registers, the context for one process, pulling it off the processor and replacing that with the context for another process. We're switching contexts. Just like processes can have context switching, in this sense, threads can also have context switching. We can switch between threads of execution within a single process. Just like processes have process control blocks, then we also have to have threads having thread control blocks or TCBs. So process control blocks have things like the context, the state of the registers at the point in time that it was removed from the processor, a thread can have a thread control block that has the state of process, the state of registers when it was taken off of the processor. So like the program counter. The main difference between a PCB and a TCB, PCB process control block, TCB thread control block, is that the thread control block is operating within the context of a single process. So again, one PCB may have many TCBs attached to it. We haven't really talked too much about virtual addresses. We haven't really talked about virtual memory. We haven't talked about virtual address spaces yet. So in that sense, what I want to do is quickly step through figure 26.1 to kind of give you an idea of what this looks like. On the left side of figure 26.1, what we've got is a single threaded, so a single threaded process. A single threaded process has things that we probably recognize. So things like the program code being at the top of memory, at the lowest addresses of memory. Then we've got this word heap. So that's representing dynamically allocated memory within the context of a process. And then at the very bottom, we have the stack, which grows upwards. So as we call functions, uh, different function uh, stack frames are put onto the stack growing upwards. In terms of a multi-threaded program, a multi-threaded process, a multi-threaded process is going to need to have multiple stacks. Each thread of execution is operating independently within the context of that process. 
So it might be at some different function than what another thread of execution is currently in. So on the right side of figure 26.1, we have two different stacks. Each of those stacks is corresponding to one thread. So there's two threads of execution within this one process. Both of those threads of execution have access to the same virtual address space. So it can access the heap. Both of them can access the same heap. Both of them access this and use the same program code. In this sense, we have multiple threads of execution that can share memory. They can both refer to the same memory within the process. There's a keyword that the authors are using here, thread local storage. Thread local storage here is referring to the stack that is attached to that specific thread of execution. So all the stack frames for one uh, thread of execution is thread local storage. So this is interesting. It's interesting in that we've got an ability to make it seem like within the context of one process, multiple things are happening at the same time. This is interesting, but you, you might be saying to yourself, well, we, we could already kind of do that with processes. So why are we adding this extra complexity on top of that? The main motivation for using threads over processes for concurrency. So concurrency here is multiple things executing at the same time. It appears as though they are running at the same time. The main motivation for this is that processes do not share memory. So you can have process A and process B and they do not share virtual address spaces. As far as they know, they are operating independently. If you have a process with multiple threads, so process A has threads one and two, then those two threads do share the same memory. You can do this stuff with processes, but there's additional overhead. Having to switch between processes means we have to switch between those memory spaces in the context of the processor. And there's a lot that goes on there. And we're gonna see that later when we talk about virtual memory in detail closer to the end of the course. The first kind of reason that we would wanna have concurrency then, just in general, and then using threads to do that is for parallelism. So this idea is I wanna do multiple things at the same time. In some cases, that means I'm trying to solve a big problem, but I can break that big problem into multiple smaller parts and I can solve those smaller parts either independently of each other or dependent upon each other. In the context of modern computers, we've got multiple processors on any system generally. So we can run multiple threads concurrently across multiple processors. So it makes sense to want to do this. They share that same memory so they can run concurrently and solve that problem that much faster. The other reason that we might want to use threads within the context of a single process is for not blocking, preventing blocking when we do things like I.O. Now I want you to imagine for a second that you have a web browser in front of you. You've got a web browser in front of you and you may have multiple tabs open in that web browser. One of those tabs might be doing something like uploading a file to a website and then the other tab is downloading a file from a website. Let's say that the file that it's downloading is a video. In that process, the web browser itself is a process, you're gonna have multiple threads of execution. One thread of execution in the tab that you're playing a video on might be responsible for downloading that video file. Another thread of execution within that tab that you have open for playing a video might be responsible for actually playing the video. Another thread of execution within the context of that tab might be for doing things like scrolling. If you had a single threaded process, you basically have to do all those things in order and you couldn't scroll. Wait for the entire video to download before you actually start to play it and then wait for the video to finish before you can start moving up and down on the web page. Having multiple threads of execution within the context of that process means that we can actually do all of those things, again, at the same time. Let's take a look now at figure 26.2.
This is our first figure that is showing an example of how to create threads in code. We're gonna look at that figure and then we're gonna step through a couple of other figures, kind of like switching back and forth between them because what we're gonna see is that executing threads is not deterministic. The order in which they get executed is not deterministic. We can't predict this at runtime. Uh, we can just make observations about what happens when, when it happens. Starting with figure 26.2, this is just some code that's showing what it looks like when you're creating a couple of different threads. Lines one through five at the top, these are kind of standard includes. The one that's different here is pthread.h, so that's actually bringing in the library to do pthreads now, which again is the implementation of threads that we're going to be using. There's two other, that they, two other includes that the authors have here, common and common threads, and these are their own internal library for uh, simplifying some stuff. So checking the things like the return value of um, the thread creation function rather than doing it in line. Line seven through 10 now, this is a function. This is just a regular old function. It looks a little weird. It looks a little weird because there's a void pointer Void pointers, you know, we think back to Comp 2160 where you maybe saw this and void pointers are like this magic points at nothing. I don't really know what it points at. That's okay. It points at something. That's mostly what it says. Void pointer says this points at something, but I don't know what it is. It takes a void pointer as an argument and then within the function it casts that void pointer into a character pointer, prints it out and then returns null. That's a standard function. There's nothing crazy going on there. Lines 12 through 24. So now this is the main function. This is where all the hard work is actually happening here. The first line, line 14 says pthread t p1 p2. So we're creating a couple of instances of threads. Nothing has happened yet. All we're doing is declaring variables that represent these threads. On lines 16 and 17, we're calling this function pthread create. This again is an uppercase P here because this is the author's specific version of this function. The actual code that you're going to use for running pthreads is lowercase p, pthread creates, but they do a little bit of extra checks there. It otherwise looks basically the same. But what this basically does is it takes an address to a pthread T. So you've got these two variables that you declared earlier. They're stack variables, they're pre-allocated. We're sending the address of those stack variables to this pthread create function. It's going to populate those threads with stuff, the stuff that it needs to do what it needs to do. Then the third argument to this, so the one that's my thread, we're passing a function pointer to pthread create. And what this is telling pthread create is, I want you to create a thread with this variable, so p1 and p2, and I want you to have them start executing at this function, at this function pointer, at this address. The last thing that we're passing here, a and b, this is what is ultimately put into the void star arg in the function that we've got, so my thread. Beneath that, on lines 20 and 21, we have these function calls, pthread join. Pthread join is basically the same as the wait function for processes. We're gonna stop execution here, we're gonna halt, we're gonna block, and in the main thread of execution, so we've created three threads now, or we have three concurrent threads right now, the main thread of execution, P1 and P2. In the main thread of execution, we're gonna halt, we're gonna block, and we're gonna wait until P1 is finished. And then we're gonna halt, we're gonna block until P2 is finished. So in the context of fork and wait, create and join are basically the same thing. So that's the code. Figure 26.3 then is one trace of that code. So what could possibly happen? On the left side, at the start of time here, we've got it starts running, print main begin, create thread one, three, two, thread two, and then waits for thread one. Then we move over in time a little bit to the middle it runs thread one to completion, so prints A and returns, and then it goes back to the main thread of execution. So we've joined that thread. Now we're waiting for T2 and T2 starts. T2 starts, it runs, it prints B, and we wait for completion, and then it finally prints out main end. That's one thread 
of execution through this. That's one way to execute this code. Figure 26.4 is another way that this code could execute. It starts the same way. So we start running in main on the left side. It prints out main begin, and then it creates thread one. But the difference this time is that thread one starts running immediately upon that call. So creates thread one here corresponds to pthread creates and passing the address of p1. Looking back at the last one, 26.3, the difference here is that the main thread created them both and then the thread started executing. Now we create one and one thread starts executing immediately and then it finishes and then we go back to the main thread, it creates another thread, that one starts running immediately, and then we go back to the main thread. At the time we get back to the main thread, it's before we have joined those threads. So those two calls to pthread join are just going to return immediately because those threads have actually finished executing already. And then at the end we print main end. Figure 26.5 now is a third way that this could run. We still have these three threads, the main thread of execution, thread one and thread two. This time we're creating the two threads uh, at the beginning of the main thread of execution. But instead of thread one executing first, it happens to be first in the code, but instead of thread one happening first, thread two happens first. Thread two happens, it runs to completion, and then we have waits for T1 in the main thread of execution. So we move back to the main thread of execution and it's blocked waiting for thread one to finish. Thread one then starts running and runs to completion. And then we go back to the main thread of execution and we block waiting for thread two, except thread two has already finished. And so we finish executing that code. So that one piece of code in figure 26.2, that one piece of code in figure 26.2 now has at least three different paths through it, paths of execution once we add these threads. That's interesting. That's interesting to see that we've got this one piece of code that really does not just run from top to bottom anymore, but now there's multiple different ways that it could complete. That's interesting. And it's, it's useful to think about that because it shows us how to create threads and it shows us how threads can execute, the order in which they can execute. But it doesn't tell us much about actually using threads. In terms of actually using threads, we want threads to work on data. That is the main reason why we want to have threads. For both parallelism and for preventing blocking, we want threads to actually do stuff with data. And so now we're going to have to start talking about sharing data among threads. Remember that these idea of threads, they all share the same memory. They share access to the same memory. So that means that they can actually share data with each other. They can share data with each other. Figure 26.2 is multi-threaded, but it doesn't really interact with memory in any way. It just prints stuff out and terminates. Let's instead now look at figure 26.6. This is a lot longer of an example, but the start is the same. The number of the includes that we have at the top and lines one through four are pretty much the same as what we had before, but now we don't have a cert.h. Line six now, we have this variable. It's a file scoped variable that has a couple of keywords on it that you might not recognize. Static is one that I hope that you recognize from comp 2160, but that means kind of that it's a file private variable. And then volatile means that it's a hint to the compiler to say this variable might be updated and then never used, but I still want you to have it in the code. So if there's no side effect from this, I still want you to have this in the code. I still want you to retain this value. One place that you might see this used in other contexts is with uh, memory mapped IO, but that's outside the scope of this course. Then we have a loop. We've got a function with a loop in it. The function has a similar signature to what we had before. So it's, a, it's return type is void pointer and it accepts an argument which is a void pointer. Within the function itself, so this now we're looking at lines 14 through 21. Within the function itself, the first thing we do is cast the argument to a character pointer. 
This is a look outside the right side window at this point, but just know that you can actually cast this void argument to whatever you want. So if you're passing a structure to a, a, a thread, you can just cast that void pointer to that specific structure if you need to. Within that thread now, we have this loop. It loops 10 to the seven times. So it loops a lot of times, and then it, within the context of that loop, what it's doing is incrementing that shared variable. It's incrementing that file scope variable. The expectation that we have for this, so looking at the main code now, the expectation that we have for this, and this kind of looks the same as what the last uh, example did, the expectation that we have for this is that each of these are going to run to completion and then print out something at the end. And what I would expect is that we've got two threads. Those two threads are executing that loop. That means that each of those threads runs one E7 times. So we should get two, two E7 at the end, the sum of those two things running um, in total. That's what I would expect to get printed out, 20 million. That's what I would expect to have happen is 20 million be printed out at the end of this loop. But the problem with this is that while it may sometimes print out 20 million at the end of the execution, it doesn't always print out 20 million. Sometimes it prints out some smaller number than 20 million. It never prints out bigger numbers than 20 million, but sometimes and often it prints out smaller numbers than 20 million. That's baffling. That's baffling and it's really frustrating if you were to take this code and write it yourself and run it and then wonder why is this happening? I don't understand why this is happening and it's destroying me to see that it's happening. There's actually two different things that are happening here. The first thing is that what we think are atomic is not atomic. There's this statement that we have in this line of code that's responsible for incrementing a value in memory. That's one statement, but that one statement ultimately compiles down into three separate instructions, a load, an, an add, and a store. The second half of this is that the first part, we're not atomic. This actually compiles down into three instructions. The second part is basically that the operating system is free to replace the currently running thread of execution at any instruction. So we've got these three instructions. It's not atomic. And our operating system has the ability to replace the current thread of execution in any of those state places. Let's see if we can take a look at solving each of those problems individually and try to figure out what we can do about this issue. The first thing we're going to look at is one way that that increment uh, statement can compile down into assembly language instructions. So in our high level language, we've got this statement that increments our value by one. In terms of the way that we perceive programs, that's that one statement is atomic. As far as we know, that line of code has to execute before the next line of code can happen. But when we take this high level language and compile it down into assembly languages, it really turns out being that there are multiple steps. So the first step here to incrementing a value is to load it from memory. The first instruction that we're taking a look at here is basically taking this address and it's loading the value at that address into this register EAX. The second instruction that we have is now going to increment that value. So we're going to increment the value in EAX with the literal value one. We're going to add to the value in EAX, the literal value one, and the sum of that gets stored in EAX, but we ultimately have to put that value back into memory again. So we've got the load, we've got the add, and then we've got the store. Take what's in EAX right now and write it back into that same address that we loaded it from originally. We're going to take a look now at figure 26.7. Figure 26.7 is basically taking these three assembly language instructions and showing us what could happen in terms of the way that the OS is able to interfere with the control flow of threads of execution. We have multiple threads of execution. So figure 26.7, we've got the operating system, 
So the stuff that we've talked about before in terms of processes, what the operating system is doing, and then we've got two threads of execution. We're kind of ignoring that there's that main thread of execution in this program that's waiting for those threads to finish. The very first thing that we have here is in figure 26.7 is that thread one starts executing. So we've got this little part here that's before the critical section. Before the critical section, on the right side of this diagram, we can see the values of certain registers and the value of the counter variable in memory right now. So before the critical section, the program counter for uh, thread one is set to be 100. And you can see which instructions at the, are, are at which address at the bottom. So you've got 100, 105, and 108 corresponding to each of those three instructions to increment that value. The value of EAX is it's zero technically. We don't really care because it's gonna be overwritten right away, but for now we'll just say that it's zero. And then the counter itself, the value of counter itself in memory is 50. The first thing that happens in thread one is that that move instruction, we're loading that value from memory into a register. So the thing that changes here in the PC EAX and counter is that the program counter has increased to the next instruction the value of the register EAX is now what was in counter in memory. Then we do the add. So we're adding to the value in EAX, uh, the literal value one, and the program counter has changed. Now at this point, the operating system receives a timer interrupt. So that remember back to the way that we do context switching and mode switching direct execution of the CPU of processes. The same thing is true with threads here. Threads of execution can be interrupted in exactly the same way that processes can. So the timer interrupt fires and the operating system takes over. So there's this mode switch that happens. There are enough registers saved for the operating system to take over. We go into the handler for that interrupt. The interrupt Handler then basically decides, I'm going to do a context switch to another thread. I'm going to switch to another thread of execution within this process. So the operating system saves the context for thread one. It saves the registers that were, that the value of the registers for thread one, but it does not save the value of memory because memory is shared between those two threads. It saves the registers for thread one, and then it restores the registers for thread two. Restoring the registers for thread two, when you look on the right side of this diagram now, it's back to 100 for the program counter. EAX is set back to zero and the value of counter in memory has not changed yet. We never actually got to the, the store instruction in thread one before thread two started taking over. So that value hasn't changed yet. After we've restored thread two, then we start executing in thread two. Thread two now does that the full three step uh, increment. So it does the load, it takes the value of counter and it puts it into EAX. It does the add, it increases the value of EAX by one and then it does the store. So it writes the value of EAX as it is right now back into memory. At that point, another timer interrupt happens and the operating system takes over again. So we do the mode switch, we do the context switch we're saving the state of, of thread two, so we're taking the program counter and the value of EAX, and we're storing that in the thread control block. And then the operating system is restoring the state of thread one. The state of thread one that we stored, we're looking back up now, is that it was at 108 for the program counter, and the value of EAX was 51. When we restore the state for thread one, we're not overwriting the value of counter because that's in memory and we're not changing memory when we do context switches between threads. But really importantly, the program counter has already gone past the load. It's already gone past the add. At this point, the program counter for thread one is at the store instruction. So the store here is saying, take the value of EAX that is on the processor right now which we've literally just restored to be 51 from what the thread one thread of execution had incremented it to previously and write that back into memory for where counter is. 
So at that point, we've executed two add instructions. We've added the literal value one twice to this value. But the end side effect is that we only have one of those add instructions reflected. Because thread one was interrupted before it finished storing, thread two didn't know that thread one had even started working on that value. Thread two finished executing and then thread one took over and then just overwrote what thread two had written. This specific situation is called a race condition. Very specifically, this kind of race condition is called a data race. So basically we've got values in memory where two or more threads of execution are kind of competing for that. They're both trying to write, read from, and explicitly write to that same value in memory. The loop that we have, or very, very specifically the instruction that's within, or the, sorry, the statement that's within that loop is called a critical section. It's called a critical section because there can be multiple threads of execution that try to execute that statement. And that statement itself is a race condition. So multiple threads of execution can enter a race condition here. Ideally, what we want is one of two things. We either want to make that statement itself atomic, or we want to prevent entry of multiple threads of execution into that critical section. The first approach, making that statement atomic, is only possible if we can make instructions that are atomic that do everything that that statement does. So it would be really great if we could take those three instructions, load, add, store, and make that one instruction, a load, add, store instruction. Now think about that for a second. If we had three instructions before, and the problem happened because the operating system could interrupt or the timer could interrupt in between any of those three instructions. If we make it one instruction, it doesn't matter if the thread of execution is interrupted before because it hasn't tried to load anything yet. And it doesn't matter if it happens after because the thread of, in, thread of execution has already finished writing to it. If each thread of execution only has one atomic instruction to do that increment, then there is no race condition anymore. That's a reasonable idea. It's a reasonable idea, and in fact, it's a real thing. x86 processors support this. Some processor architectures support this. And C++11, this is something that I've learned, C++11 has a function that has a, this atomic um, fetch and then add function as part of the language features for C++11. You can do this with x86 and it is a, an assembly language primitive. So you actually have to have assembly language in your C code to be able to do this. Think about that for a second. There, as far as we know, there's no way for us to tell C this ad should be atomic versus other ads not being atomic. So the only way to do this is to, to take advantage of hardware support as, as in the form of assembly language instructions. This is, this is a fine idea, and it would be even reasonable for us to extend on this and say, well, let's do this for all arithmetic operations. So let's take times equals, let's take divide equals, mod equals, and then let's do bitwise operations. It's reasonable for us to do that. We can enumerate all those things. We know what all the operations are possibly for that and make atomic instructions for each of those. Load, do operations, store. Let's make one instruction, atom one atomic instruction for each of those different arithmetic operators. And that's reasonable to want to do. The problem starts to happen when you're looking at data structures and when we're thinking about operating systems and when we're thinking about anything really, we're dealing with data structures all the time. So we're going to have to do lists, we're going to have to do queues, trees, so many trees. It's not really reasonable to expect an instruction set architecture to have an atomic instruction for insert into a binary tree. It's not reasonable for an instruction set architecture to have an assembly language instruction that is atomic to remove something from a red-black tree. It's not reasonable for an assembly language to have an atomic instruction that can modify a graph 
It just doesn't make any sense. There are too many possible things that we would want to do. So having atomic instructions, while great and reasonable in some cases, we can have that fetch and add and have that be one atomic instruction. While it's reasonable to do that for some basic arithmetic operators, more generally, this is not really going to work for us. Instead, what we want hardware to provide for us are something called synchronization primitives. We're going to get into this later, but the basic idea here is that we want the hardware to give us the ability to say only one thread of execution can enter this critical section at a time. That way, we can guarantee that an instruction will be executed atomically by one thread of execution. What this ultimately means is that threads of execution may be switched on, but they will be prevented from continuing because they're stuck waiting for some other thread to finish. But we'll get more into that when we talk about locks with P threads. Locks are going to let us limit access to critical sections, which kind of solves our problem in terms of data races and race conditions. And that is related to one of the reasons why we wanted to use threads in the first place, which was for parallelism. So having multiple threads of execution operating on the same data to make it go a little bit faster, take advantage of multiple cores, have multiple threads running concurrently, literally at the same time and not just at the same time, and have them all working concurrently on the same data structure. That works great, locks work great, for that specific situation, but it doesn't really help us in that other situation where we've got our web browser. We're trying to prevent blocking by using multiple threads. In that case, what we want is some way for threads to communicate with each other, to communicate that events have happened, that they're allowed to proceed because some other thing has finished doing what it was doing. That's related to locking, but it's not really the same locking out of a critical section the way that we're thinking about in terms of locks around a critical section to prevent data races and race conditions. Think again about this web browser idea. We've got one thread that's responsible for downloading the video. We've got one thread that's responsible for playing the video. And then another thread that's responsible for allowing the web browser to scroll up and down. Ideally, what we would want to have happen, instead of having that thread that downloads the video complete downloading the video before the video can start playing, is we want that thread that downloads the video, video to be able to download enough and then tell the other thread that's playing the video there's enough for you to start playing. This synchronization primitive that we're going to again look at eventually is called a condition variable. And this is going to allow threads to communicate among each other to say, hey, I'm done or I'm done enough that you can start working on this other thing. So finally, one thing that you might be thinking is, why are we talking about this in the context of an operating systems class? Threads, to be clear, are a user space problem. In fact, they're a user space problem, as I said before, to the point that we could build our own threading library. It's possible to do this. It's possible for us, literally me and you, to write a threading library without having operating system support. It's possible for us to do this. We're not going to do that. We're not going to do that, but it's possible for us to do this. A lot of the things that we're seeing with threads, preventing multiple threads of execution from interacting with and writing to specific memory locations, notifying each other of events that are happening. These are the same kind of problems that operating systems deal with in terms of processes. Now remember, processes don't have the ability to see each other's memory space, which is what threads do have the ability to do. They are operating within the context of a single process. Processes are isolated from each other. But processes do actually have a way to interact with each other. It's at a lower level than we're thinking about with threads. The way that processes can interact with each other is through the file system. So they can interact with each other through files. Now think about that for a second. 
you've got multiple processes that are probably running on your computer right now. And of those processes that are running, it's conceivable that at least two of them are using the same file. An operating system has to do things like prevent multiple processes from trying to modify the same file at the same time. They have to prevent that so that the two processes that might be trying to compete for operations on that file don't clobber each other's rights so that they don't interfere with each other's rights and so that ultimately they don't corrupt the data structures that the operating system is using internally to represent that file system. So a lot of the problems that we're seeing with threads are similar to the problems that we see with processes at the operating system side. So that's it for threads. It came inside because it was raining. Yeah, that's it for threads. That's it for threads. See you soon. Bye-bye.